Normally, this time would be devoted to your second commercial. However, I would like to use it now to tell you just a bit about the California Academy of Sciences, the institution which produces science in action. The Academy is one of the oldest and most distinguished scientific organizations in the United States. And we're quite proud of that fact. The Academy is dedicated to scientific research and public education in science. Now, public education takes several forms. Here, Dr. Robert C. Miller, academy director and noted marine biologist, conducts a group of young people on an outing to study plant and animal life at the ocean's edge. Later, through Science in Action, they shared their experiences with thousands of others. The mysterious ways of a small crab or the magic of the distant planets may be equally fascinating. When it was found impossible to procure a planetarium projector from the Zeiss Company, our academy staff proceeded to design the only major planetarium that has ever been completely constructed within the United States. Here we are on the roof of the planetarium building, but the instruments we see have nothing to do with the stars. As a service to the United States Weather Bureau, academy staff members keep regular records of various phases of the weather. The Natural History and Science Museums in the Steinhardt Aquarium continue the public education program in still another way. For example, more than a million and a half visitors come to Steinhardt Aquarium every year to view the reptiles, fish, and marine animals which have been gathered from every part of the world. Here is a very rare cannibalistic South American horned frog. And of course, washing down the back of green and hawksbill turtles and scrubbing the back as well is quite important in preparing them for display. The long-established reputation of the Academy has earned us the cooperation of organizations in all fields of science. Here, a great hospital permitted us to film the administration of Mistogen, an unprecedented effort to keep alive a baby unable to breathe. Later, this became a part of one of the medical shows which form an important portion of any science in action series. Industry has been quite generous in sending us top scientists to tell the story of how science is applied to the products and services that we use every day. Now, this span extends from the comparatively new and dramatic synthetics industry to the old and still vitally important railroad business. Each series of Science in Action is balanced to include subjects appealing to every taste. The film that you are viewing covers only one topic in one field. The broad overall scope of the entire program appeals to all interests in science and to all ages. Incidentally, there is one thing I'd like to mention, and that is the fact that the Animal of the Week feature provides an excellent bridge for the middle commercial. Well, that gives us a very good idea of the sort of thing that you might hear if you were sitting on one of these listening devices in a submarine. Well, now, uh, to uh, go into this next point, which is the selection of personnel for submarine work, which I know is a very, very important thing. We have asked to come to the laboratory for the crew of the submarine training facility at Mare Island. So perhaps, uh, Admiral, you'd give us an idea as to what's involved now in uh, oh, selection of people, or physical condition, lungs, ears, um, chest, uh, vision, teeth, and all that sort of thing. Well, I'm very happy to see that we have these lads here from Mare Island. It gives our audience a chance to see just what submarine sailors look like. Now, all of these lads have gone through a very extensive training at the submarine base at, Nar at, Mar Isle, at uh, New London. The last two lads over there have just come out and they're all full of vim and vigor and ready to go to sea. All fine. The two chiefs have been in submarines for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. As you know, they're, <clears throat> they're selected as being perfect physical specimens. They have to have good heart, good lungs. They have to have good eyes, good night uh, adaptation. Mm -hmm. And they also have to have good teeth in order to grasp the mouthpiece of a of a Momsen lung. Say, we have a, we have a uh, cutaway section here of a Momsen lung. First of all, here's the mouthpiece that is put into the mouth, and then here is the inside container. Right here is where the oxygen is put into the unit, and the oxygen comes down here, of course, and this is a soda lime cylinder, which helps in the, uh, in the overall circulation of the breath, or the, uh, the breathing into this, and taking the oxygen out of it. I see one of the boys has one on there now, Perhaps we can uh, just look over there and see uh, what it would be like if he were using this piece of equipment. These lungs are used in training so that they may be ready to escape from a sunken submarine if necessary. Mm -hmm. They're first given a series of dives from 18 feet, coming up with a lung. And then they come up from 50 feet, 
And finally, they come up from 100 feet. That, uh, that diving tower in which they do this work is certainly something that's, uh, that's uh, most uh, amazing. Uh, in other words, a man that couldn't uh, make this ascent from 100 feet up to the surface, he wouldn't be suitable for submarine work, would he? That's correct. <laughs> in addition to all these qualifications, a submarine sailor has to be able to get along with his shipmates. They have to have a very even disposition, even temperament. They have to be uh, thoroughly dependable. They have to be men that you can't stampede under any circumstances. Well, since the life of each man on board is in the hands of his uh, fellow sailor, of course, that becomes vitally important. Uh, uh, of course, there are a lot of other things that fit into this thing that we don't have time to go into right at the moment, but since we've seen some of the components now of... Uh, of a submarine, both the equipment and personnel. Suppose we go now and see just what a submarine would be like under action. Well, I'd like to say that those, uh, those uh, physical qualifications and those temperaments we've described very thoroughly fit the submarine of the submarine service. And they certainly fitted the 46,000 men and 4,000 officers that served in submarines in the Pacific in World War II. I was highly honored to command that force. Oh, fine. Well, let's watch a submarine now and see what, uh, what would uh, happen under full activity. Up periscope. Bearing mark 829. Range mark 6100. Down periscope. Angle on the bow, starboard 15. Right full rudder. Right full rudder. All ahead two thirds. All ahead two thirds. Third. New course two four zero. New course two four zero. What's the distance to the track? One seven double up. Control six three feet. Control six three feet. Forward torpedo room. Make ready all tubes. Forward torpedo room. Make ready all tubes. Set depth twelve feet. Set depth twelve feet. Rake for silent running. Rake for silent running. Rake for depth charge. Rake for depth charge. Steady on two five zero. Oh. All ahead, one third. All ahead, one third. How much time I got? None, sir. Torpedo run one one double O. Range about one six double O. Gyro zero zero five increasing. Shoot any time. Stand by forward. Stand by forward. Up periscope. Check bearing and shoot. Bearing. Mark. Big four five. Down periscope. Set. Fire. Fire one. One fire, sir. Fire. Fire two. Two fired. Fire. Fire three. Three fired. Set. Fire. Fire four. It is inevitable that in accomplish her, accomplishing her mission, the submarine will expose herself to retaliation. Now let's take a look and see how the enemy fights back. Deal. Depth charge. Well, that was certainly nerve-wracking. Did that sub get away, Admiral? That one did, but we lost 52 in World War II, and 39 of them, we don't know what happened to them. But we think most of them were lost to depth charge. Mm -hmm. We lost a total of 374 officers and 3,131 men. Well, it's certainly sad and very unfortunate that we should have those losses, but let's look and see what the submarines did. On this chart, we see that the, the tonnage, for example, of the uh, submarines in the Pacific Warfare Miscellaneous type of shipping sunk in millions of tons, mines, uh, surface craft, and then land-based aircraft. You see they sunk quite a bit more than uh, carrier-based aircraft. And finally, submarines sunk about 5 million tons, 73% of the total uh, sunk in the Pacific. Now, I know uh, that uh, one of your chief interests is the midget submarine, and I read your article recently in Collier's. What can you tell us about midget subs? Well, in my opinion, Earl, the midget submarine is one of the deadliest weapons ever devised. Mm -hmm. It won its spurs in World War II. Four navies used it, uh, the British and the Italians, with a special eff effectiveness. It's, she's so small that she can fit in your backyard, and she can enter waters that no 
large size, full size submarine could enter. It'll be carried by helicopters and it could be carried conditions. by helicopters, and their crew can leave her the ship to put mines on the bottom of uh, enemy ships, mm -hmm. and the laying of an atomic mine in an enemy harbor would be very simple. Mm -hmm. Well, now suppose we join, uh, rejoin Admiral Nimitz, because I know one of his favorite subjects is the uh, submarine of the future, and perhaps uh, Admiral Nimitz can give us an idea on the uh, Nautilus uh, mural here just what this means. Well, Earl, you see here one of the deadliest submarines of all time the atomic-powered USS Nautilus. She is very much like the conventional submarine in that she has everything that a conventional submarine has. She has a diesel engine, she has <coughs> batteries, but her main propulsive plant is atomic-powered, an atomic-powered boiler which depends on its heat from an, a, an atomic pile and that generates steam in the boiler which passes into a steam turbine. Now this submarine has many capabilities, some of which you've heard, heard about. Time does not permit us to tell about all of them, but the submarine with this atomic powered plant will give us an indication of how atomic energy can be used for purposes of peace. Well, that's certainly uh, putting it very pointedly, Admiral Lemmis. I want to thank you for coming to Science and Action to be with us and bring this fine material. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you and to join you in the program and to meet my old shipmate, Charlie Lockwood, who commanded our submarines so efficiently and effectively in World War II. It's a great pleasure to me, sir, to meet my old big boss in the Pacific. Oh, as well. Now, I want to say thanks to you, too, Admiral thank Lockwood. You, I'll be back in just a moment with the Animal of the Week. Our special animal of the week is a toucan, a very strange bird that comes from South America and Central America and Mexico. This one is named Raymond as the special pet of Mr. Blaylock, who's brought him to the program. Uh, what about that big bill there, uh, uh, Andy? Well, I'll tell you, well, that's fooled quite a number of ornithologists. I don't think they've made up their mind just exactly why it is so large. It's mostly fake. It's very light and rather hollow. You'll notice that when he eats, he has to take it in the tip of his bill, and then he tosses it up and swallows it that way. No, well, he's certainly yeah, one of the most interesting fellow. I'm going to try and throw this one up in the air and see what happens on this. Here you go. Here you go, Raymond. Come on. Come on. Here you go. Oh, oh, he almost caught it. Well, now, you were telling me earlier they have a unique way of taking water. They can't drink as a normal bird would do. Uh, perhaps uh, we'll see if Raymond well, maybe is, we can. He's is interested in any water here now. He's more or less of a dribble puss. Oh, he is? Oh, there he is. Ah, Pretty there good. he goes. You know, nice. he, he dips it down and it rolls down. That tongue must be about, uh, oh, must be about four or six inches long, isn't it? Something it like is. That. It's shaped sort of like a palm leaf. Uh -huh. well, this is really a very, very nice bird. The colors, of course, there's orange on the bill, green up here, a brilliant blue eye, white, black. <laughs> down here on the tail, yellow up in here, and orange on the tail feathers down in here. Beautiful bird. About 63 of these uh, are known from various parts yeah, of the Americas. South and, uh, America. This is one of the uh, largest of all the species. A very, very beautiful fellow. Now, what are you going to do with uh, Raymond? Are you going to keep him as a pet? Well, he's quite a clown, and we got a, a big kick out of him, Earl. He's one of the most interesting birds <laughs> I think we've ever had. Oh, well, he's really a very nice fellow. Well, um, I hope that you will keep us informed on how Raymond does in the future, because he's certainly uh, the most spectacular of all the animals of the week that we've had here. Thank, Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, <clears throat> I have something very special to show you. This is something that many zoologists have not seen. It is all that is left of the left hind leg of the largest animal that has ever lived on this earth. It's not an extinct animal, it's an animal that lives today. This is the vestige, the back leg of the giant blue whale, 110 feet maximum length, 200,000 pounds maximum weight. Incidentally, in our next program, we're going to talk about whales. And our special guest will be Dr. Robert T. Orr of the California Academy of Sciences. We hope that you will plan to be with us then. You have just seen another in the fascinating television series, Science in Action. Science in Action is produced by the California Academy of Sciences under the supervision of Dr. Robert C. Miller.